Dr. Omid Safi is a leading public Muslim intellectual in America. He is a professor of Islamic studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, specializing in contemporary Islamic thought and classical Islam. He is the past chair for the study of Islam and the current chair for the Islamic mysticism group at the American Academy of Religion, the largest international organization devoted to the academic study of religion. Omid is an award-winning teacher and speaker and was nominated six times at Colgate University for the Professor of the Year Award and before that twice at Duke University for the Distinguished Lecturer Award. At the University of North Carolina, he received the award for mentoring minority students in 2009 and the Sitterson Teaching Award for Professor of the Year in April of 2010. He is the editor of the volume Progressive Muslims on Gender, on Justice, Gender, and Pluralism. His work, po his work Politics of Knowledge in Pre-Modern Islam, Dealing with Medieval Islamic History and Politics was published by UNC Press in 2006. His Voices of Islam, Voices of Change was published by Prager in 2006 as well. His last book was published by HarperCollins titled Memories of Muhammad and deals with the biography and legacy of the Prophet Muhammad. He has a forthcoming volume from Princeton University Press on the famed mystic Rumi, who you'll hear more about this evening. The Carnegie Foundation recognized Omid as a leading scholar of Islam in 2007-2008 for studying contemporary Islamic debates in Iran. That topic will be the topic of his next book from Harvard University Press. Omid is very busy with books and publishing. His volume on American Islam is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. He has been among the most frequently sought speakers on Islam in popular media, appearing frequently in the New York Times, Newsweek, Washington Post, PBS, NPR, NBC, CNN, and international media. He has recently been designated as a lead Islam writer for the Huffington Post and the lead Muslim writer for the Religion News. Please welcome Professor Omid Safi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wassalamu wa salat ala ashraf al-makhluqat. Sayyidina Muhammad. Thank you, friends, for coming. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come. Uh, those of you that have ever had a chance to hear me speak before know that I have an uh, ultimately boring way of starting each and every single talk that I give. Uh, but it is its repetition should not take away from its heartfelt nature, which is to thank people for the gift of your time. Uh, there is no greater form of generosity that I feel that we have uh, in this life than to share our time with specific people and for particular causes. Uh, other commodities can always be um, supplanted. We can always make more money. Um, if you're like me and your size goes up and down, uh, you can buy the right kind of clothes that fits you. Um, but time is different. Uh, time is finite. And within the Islamic tradition, we're even told that the number of breaths that we get to take in our life is maktub. It is prescribed. It is written. Uh, and so particularly for an audience like uh, you all, or as we would say in North Carolina, y'all, um, to, to have taken an hour of your time and your life to come here is something that leaves me very humbled and in awe. And my uh, goal and prayer and intention, inshallah, is that we come away from, from this talk uh, richer and um, kinder, softer, uh, and more willing to do the work that so desperately needs to be done uh, in, in this world. Uh, some of you may wonder about the, the choice of topic of uh, in an age where there's so much suffering going on uh, and people in this very building that we're standing at now banging on the drums of war, past wars and future wars. Uh, why talk about love and why talk about poetry and why talk about famed Muslim mystics? And that's something that I will come back to at the very end. And my hope is that you would come to see that within this particular tradition, love 
and justice have an intimate relationship with one another. But we cannot get to the point of affirming the need for justice at a social level, at a political level, unless we have also come to ground that within an understanding of love. Love not as mere sentimentality. And that's probably the first important point that I would like to make. When someone like Molana, and I, I might switch between calling him Rumi and Molana, it's hard for me to call him Rumi since he never called himself Rumi. Nobody called him Rumi for century. Rumi just means the Roman. Uh, he was never called the Roman. Uh, so his, his students and his friends called him Maulana, our master. Uh, and you know a guy has made it when a title like that, as generic as it was, became a proper noun. Um, Maulana now, Mevlana in Turkish, refers to one person. Uh, the same is actually true of the text that we're going to be, inshallah, looking at today, the Masnavi. Masnavi just means a long book of poetry that rhymes. Every line has a specific rhyme. A, A, B, B, C, C, and so on. It's the easiest form in which you can have a long poem because you don't have to sustain the same rhyme, right? Uh, within the Persian tradition that Milana comes from, uh, there are literally thousands of Masnavis written. But if you go to any bookstore and say, I want a copy of the rhyming couplets, they're going to hand you a copy of Milana's masterpiece. That's extraordinary. And let's just talk for one second about the significance that this text has had. There's a friend of mine who works at Harvard, so you know everything he says must be true. Um, and part of what he does for a living is to count manuscripts. He goes to different manuscript libraries and he writes down how many manuscripts of the Quran, of the Hadith of Bukhari, of the Hadith of Muslim, of this tafsir and that tafsir they have. And in his reckoning, in the eastern part of the Islamic world, by which we mean everything from, let's say, Bosnia to Bangladesh historically, the Masnavi is second only to the Quran in terms of the number of copies that we possess. Right? Nowadays, you can just walk down to a bookstore and buy a copy. Or if you're like my students, you can illegally download uh, things if you, if you like. Think of a world in which to have a book, it had to be hand copied. Something which, in the case of the Masnavi, would take maybe a few years. A good copy would have taken that long. And then maybe some time longer to have it be ornamented. So the fact that there are these <coughs> tens of thousands of manuscript copies of the Masnavi second only to the Quran, leads us to realize that in a very real and tangible sense, after the Quran, no other text and no other author has had such an impact on the religious imagination of Muslims. This is true, of course, in Iran, where people still speak Persian, and so Masnavi is taught from elementary school. It's certainly true in Turkey, where Molana, to borrow a term from another religious tradition, is the patron saint of the Turkish context. And to give but one indication of the significance of Molana within the South Asian context, I will just refer to um, the exquisite scholar Anne-Marie Schimmel, who said that Molana's impact on the subcontinent was even greater than the impact he had on Iran. Right? So we're talking about a being, a text, a set of teachings that has shaped our, our understanding. <laughs> and yet this is difficult for us to do, difficult for us to appreciate, difficult for us to engage, because it's kind of like trying to read Milton without ever having read the Bible. The situation in which we find ourselves today is that there are two forces that you would think have nothing in common. But they're actually working very hard to disentangle this common shared ground of a spiritually and mystically vibrant variety of Islam, which adamantly insisted that there is a path to God, and that path is radical love, extreme love, 
a love that would come and burn inside you everything that is other than God. So who are the folks who are trying to disentangle this? Well, on one hand, you have a group of Orientalists, as well as Muslims, Salafi Muslims, Wahhabi Muslims, whatever you want to call them, that when they see things that talk about poetry and love and mysticism, they're like, well, this is not real Islam. So they're trying to demarcate an Islam where all the poetry and the love stuff and the philosophical stuff has been extracted out of it. And on the other side, particularly in this country, we've got a whole set of folks who are like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. <laughs> um, and some of my best friends are spiritual and not religious. Um, I love Rumi. I love me some Rumi. Could you just not bring your God talk into it a little bit? Because it turns me off. <laughs> call it the beloved. I'm with you as long as you call it the beloved. So on that side, there's an attempt to extract Molana from his Islamic home into a kind of universalist, trans-historical prophet of love who meant to write for people in San Francisco. <laughs> So even the trans-historical part has a limit uh, to it, sort of, as well. So we're going to try to resist that and take the Masnavi seriously on its own ground. The handout that you have is so that you don't have to worry about writing down some lines. You can just refer to cer certain things. Um, and when people start reading the Masnavi, sometimes they're at first dazzled by the variety of stories that you get. And they're funky stories. Some of them are exquisite and sublime and mystical. And then you got a story right here in the first book about the fly that's riding on a piece of straw on a puddle of piss. <laughs> and it's saying, just like the Titanic movie, I'm king of the world, <laughs> right? It's a funny story, right? Because it doesn't get it. It doesn't get that it has limited itself to that small domain until you begin to realize that we are the fly. And our status, our recognition, our jobs, the number of friends I have on Facebook, that is the piece of straw in a puddle of piss that I and we attach our significance to. Um, so part of what I think I'm trying to do is to get us to not read the Masnavi as a series of disconnected stories, but to actually notice a pattern. I'm only going to talk about the first book of the Masnavi, and in passing, remember that within the Mevlevi tradition, they teach us that one should take 40 years to discuss the first 18 lines. I might keep you for 45 minutes, but I'm not going to keep you for, for, for 40 years. Um, and in fact, very early on, Molana and his followers figured out that people are reading this wrong. So Molana's son, Sultan Valad, writes a book in which he says, I had to write a book because these people are stupid. They're dumb, dumb, dumb. When they read the Masnavi, they think it's about a donkey and angels and prophets. They don't get it that every character that Molana talks about is you. It's all inside you. So you read the Masnavi as a guide to your own inner faculties. And we'll talk about that in, in, in just a second. Um, And this is true you know, of, of many of the stories that we're going to encounter in the Masnavi. The Masnavi, right after the story of the Ney, begins with a famous story of the king and the maiden and the smith. And there's a murder involved. <coughs> the king falls in love with the maiden. He finds that the maiden is sick, and so he calls a doctor. And the doctor has to figure out what disease the maiden is suffering from. And like a good Muslim doctor, like a good Greek doctor, you diagnose diseases by checking somebody's pulse. And it turns out that the disease that she's suffering from is that one terminal, incurable, and quite possibly contagious disease, love. 
for Muslim medicine, for Greek medicine, health, wellness, comes through balance, balance of the humors. Too much hot, too much cold, you balance it out. Every disease is cured by its opposite. But the Muslims said, love is the one disease where the cure is the cause, not the opposite, is the cause. And what is the cause of love? One glance, one description, one word, one image. And if that sounds so unbelievable for us cynical people, what is our love for God based on other than a series of words, a couple of images? We fall in love with that beloved, sight unseen. Right? One glance, one word leads you to love and then you burn in agony wanting more, what's the only thing that's going to make you feel better? Another glance, another word. And then what happens after you've had a second glance? You burn more. So this is a disease that there is no end, as the Sufis would say, the path has no end because the beloved has no end. And you burn until there's nothing left in you of that hard to translate word, nafs. I don't like translating it as self. I don't like translating it as soul. The closest I can come, and I'm a parent, so you'll have to bear with me, is that me, 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 me in all of us. That tendency, it's not a thing, that tendency in all of us that goes, mine. If I saw it, it's mine. If I thought about it, it's mine. I looked at it, it's mine. Not for you, mine, mine. If you watch Lord of the Rings, perfect representation of the nafs. My precious. And eventually you end up in hellfire, quite literally, right? So as we get to take a look at the, the Masnavi, um, what I want to do is just to take us through some of the ways that I hope our path can, can, um, can be uh, made clear. If you have your handout, take a look at the image that you see on one side of it. And this should look somewhat familiar. It looks a lot like the Quran. It looks a lot like Quranic illumination, right? And then if you take a look around the edges of the page, you see hundreds of little arrows pointing out. And then you see a few larger circular medallions pointing to the side of the page. Right? Not surprisingly, Molana is drawing an analogy between his own masterpiece, the Masnavi, and the Quran. And it becomes decorated. This particular copy that you have was something that was finished in the year 1278, five years after Molana passes away. So what's the idea here? Well, think back to some of the Quranic descriptions. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq wa fi anfusahum hatta yatabayyana lahum innahul haq. We, God, shall show them our signs in three places, right? The word sign also means verses of the Quran, one. Fil afaq, on the furthest horizons, i.e. in the natural cosmos, so the scripture is one place that you encounter God. Nature is the other masterpiece, the other scripture. Right? One reason why the Muslim sages usually referred to the natural cosmos as the existential Quran. Right? A lot of resources for uh, an environmentalist ethic within that teaching. And then the part that's significant always for the mystic. Wafi and fusahim and inside their own souls. You come to encounter God inside your own souls. Hatta, until it becomes clear to you that He is the real. He is the truth, capital T. 
For these kinds of mystics like Rumi, this is an indication that you come to see God, yes, on pages of the book, yes, within nature, but also through that grandest mystery of them all, which is the human being. Those of you who are married can think about the ultimate mystery that your partner is. You can be with them for 30 years and not really have a clue exactly what's going on on the inside. And if this is the person that you're intimate with, how much more so about the rest of humanity? This is what Molana takes to be man arafa nafsahi faqad arafa rabbihi, the one who knows one's own soul knows God. Which is to say, you can't know God unless you know yourself. The knowledge of humanity and the knowledge of God become linked together in that context. If you um, can read what my children call squiggly lines, um, Arabic, Persian, Urdu, uh, Ottoman, uh, you see that in this manuscript copy that you have, the first line is easy, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Hadha kitab al-Masnavi. This is the book of the Masnavi, and the translation is below. This is the book of the Masnavi, and it is Usul, Usul, Usul din right? Which I actually don't like the translation here very much. I love the translation by Javed Majaddidi, my dear and very gifted Rumi translator. This one particular phrase I'm not so fond of, he translated it as the roots of the main tenets of theology. It's a little more graphic than that. It is the root of the root of faith. And then someone went through literally with a red pen and said, no, 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 no. It's not the root of the root of the faith. It's the root of the root. And they do exactly like your second grade teacher does. They say, you missed a word. They open up one of these things, and they write in another root on top of it. Think about this. What is a, it's a tree metaphor, right? Muslim scholars love to divide every discipline to roots and branches. Roots and branches. What does a root do? It grounds you. It grounds you so that when the inevitable storms of life come, you don't get knocked over. And then what else does the root do for you? Nourishes, Nourishes you, right? So this teachings of the Masnavi, Molana says, it's the root that grounds and sustains what grounds and sustains what grounds and sustains faith. In other words, if you hang on to the external aspects of the faith, if you do all the prayers, but those prayers are not done with presence, you haven't nurtured those trees. This is exactly the metaphor that we get from Molana's son, Sultan Balat. He says, a man came up to the Prophet, uh, and he wanted to talk to him, and he went and he did his prayers. And he came back, and the Prophet says, you didn't pray. Go back and do your prayers. The man goes back, does his gymnastics, as people who try to fit prayers in you know, half times of uh, sports venues tend to do, um, and comes back and the prophet says, you didn't pray. And he does this three times, and eventually he says, the only prayer that's acceptable is prayer that is done with huzur, with the presence in your heart. So we have that uh, notion here. And then in the next line, he's playing with themes that are going to stay with us through the rest of the Masnavi. Um, uh, and you've got these key words here, fi kashf, unveiling. Unveiling. It's an unabashedly erotic metaphor. Veiling and unveiling, sadly, is a little too much kind of in our news. When the Sufis are talking about it, it's not about hijab. It's about what hijabs you from God, what veils you from God. 
So we have early Sufi classics like Hujviri's Keshful Mahjub, unveiling the veiled one. And who's the veiled one? Is it God because we can't see him? Or is it us because something in us keeps us from seeing that we're already swimming in an ocean? But there is that erotic element of this is what takes place in a bridal chamber. You unveil the bride, and you achieve union. You make love. You're trying to make love to God. That's where you want to end up. You want that experience of making love with God, achieving the experience of union, so the secrets, the secrets of union, and that word secret is kind of interesting. Everybody likes a good secret. Until you begin to realize that for the Sufis, asrar, secrets, is the plural of ser, and ser is the name of the innermost layer of your heart. The greatest secret in the cosmos is the heart of humanity. That same heart where the amana, God's trust, was covered to, was offered to the mountains, was offered to the heavens, they weren't strong enough to bear it, but humanity took it on, right? That same heart, which as Molana is so fond of, of saying, putting these words in God's mouth in a Hadith Qudsi, I, God, cannot fit into heavens and earth but the heart of my loving servant suffices me. Right? That, that paradox of, of the human heart. Um, and then uh, striving to arrive at, um, at yaqeen, at, at certainty, something that the Sufis had, um, had talked about for a long time. They use Quranic metaphors. Right? There are different levels of certainty. They use oftentimes candle metaphors, right? Think of an image of a candle, right? That's ilmul yaqeen, knowledge that you have of what a candle looks like. Then see the candle, see the flame, right? That's aynul yaqeen. You come to be in the presence of, close enough that you can see it, and then there's that last phase, that last stage. Haqqul yaqeen the truth of certainty, where you become the flame. And to become the flame, these, this is a moth and flame metaphor, such a powerful one, Sham uh, Parvane, for Muslim poets. Um, you have to be willing to let go of these artificial boundaries that we have constructed, where my sense of identity ends. We're going to come back to that idea in a second. So let's go to the beginning part of, of the Masnavi. Somebody could maybe crank up the AC just a little bit uh, to make it a little cooler. That would be great. Um, the, um, you have the story of the Ney in the middle of that page, the Song of the Reed. Now listen to this Reed flute's deep lament about the heartache being a part has meant. Uh, and um, we see that Molana calls himself the reed flute. And as you all were coming in, I think there was some reed music, flute music that was playing. It's a plaintive sound. It's a sorrowful, almost mourning sound, but a very dignified one as well. What is the reed doing? It's lamenting. It's complaining from separations, not in a singular, judai ha because we suffer from multiple separations. We have an existential separation anxiety. We're separated sometimes from loved ones. There's a person that we love, and they're in another state. There's somebody that loves you, but they're in Mongolia. They have passed on from this realm of existence. There's separation for some people, including Molana himself, from his homeland. He wasn't born in Konya. He was born in the Khorasan region. Not Balkh exactly, Vakhsh is where he was born. He misses his homeland. And then he comes back to that prophetic hadith, which um, 
Muslim nationalists love to cite, Hubbul Watan Min Al Iman. Uh, the love of your homeland is a part of faith. And Mulana says, the homeland that the Prophet was talking about is not Iran or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Turkey. The homeland that the Prophet is talking about is that homeland, right? That Watan that we come from. But how do you make a reed? How do you make a reed flute? You go to place that reed, that bamboos essentially grow, what he calls neyastan. So ne is a reed. Neyastan is like Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Neyastan. You go to the Neyastan, the land of reeds, and you cut them. There's an act of violence, of separation involved. Then you bring it home and you empty out its inside. You make it hollow, just as we have to be made hollow. We have to be willing to let ourselves go of everything that blocks us on the inside. And then you take a metal rod, you put it in the fire till it's white hot, and you press it inside and against the reed, six times on one side, once in the back. Every place that the reed touches the rod, there's a hole that's created. So think about this. He starts out talking about lamentation, complaining, separation. Right? Why start there? Why is Molana starting out complaining about, I'm homesick. I miss God. I miss my homeland. I miss my community. I'm all alone. Nobody gets me. I mean, he says this here. Nobody understands me. Everyone projects their own ideas onto me. The reason that Molana starts in that place is because the Prophet says to us, nas ala qatra Speak to people at the level of their intelligence. This is where we are. We are in that state of feeling separated and alone and cut off from God. It's the same reason why if you look at the Quran, right after you get past the Fatiha, which is our petition to God. You get to Surah Al-Baqarah, and thousands of people every year make a New Year's resolution or a vow to begin reading the Quran cover to cover. The dumbest way to read the Quran, if there ever was one. And they get to Surah Al-Baqarah, and they quit after two days. Because Baqarah is a mean surah. It's like, oh, you hypocrites. Oh, you people with hardened hearts. You say one thing and you do another. In your heart, there is a disease. And may God increase you in your disease. And you're like, I'm going to close this book. <laughs> and when God is nicer, I'll come back and I'll talk to you then. You know, Why does the Baqarah speak of people that have sickened hearts? Because we have sick hearts. Because we are hypocrites. There's a great story from the life of Molana that illustrates this. The king says, I love me some Rumi. I just can't stand his followers. They're all riffraffs. They don't speak properly. They don't dress properly. And the ultimate insult of the medieval ages, they have bad adab. Nay, they have no adab. Snap. They have no exquisite, refined manners. Like the worst cuss word you could possibly have in a polite society. And Molana hears about this, and his followers are devastated, crushed. And he says, come with me. We're going to go to the king's court. He marches in, and he says, did you or did you not call my followers people that have bad manners? And the king is all embarrassed, but he's not going to lie to Molana, he put his head down and he's like, I did. And the followers are ecstatic because he's like, he's going to give it to him now. And Molana says, everything that you say about them is true. They have lousy manners. They're rude, unrefined, ugly, and hideous. This is why I took them on. 
if they were already beautiful, I would have become their disciple. This is one of the central messages of the Masnavi. It's like the take home of, of this evening. In the first chapter of the Masnavi, there's a narrative arc that you see. You start complaining about your state of separation from God. In the beginning stories of the Masnavi, it's all about the ego. It's all about mine. It's the king and the maiden, and the king kills the maiden's lover, the smith. And you get to that story, and like, he just killed. I'm, I'm fairly certain somewhere in the Quran, there's that thing about do not kill. And you kill, and you just killed. And you've got the stories of tyrannical kings, and husbands and wives arguing. And as you keep reading and you keep reading, you begin to realize that what the Masnavi actually is, it's a map of the spiritual journey that we are intended to go on. We start out raw. As Molana says, Hasel Omram Sesokhan Bish Nist, Khom Budam Pochtashudam Sukhdam. The whole of my life is summed up in these three words. I used to be raw, then I was cooked. Now I'm on fire. But I used to be raw, and we are raw, and the Masnavi talks to us when we are in that raw phase in the beginning. And you move through all the stories in the Masnavi, and I would like to maybe look at a couple of them, just uh, out of the brevity of time. And where do we end up at the end of the first volume? What glorious, fantastic, memorable story is the last story of the first book. It's the story of the man who spits on the beautiful face of Imam Ali. He's a warrior who is defeated by Ali. He's disgusted at the fact that he has lost to this young warrior, Ali. And out of disgust, he spits on what Molana describes as the pride of the prophets, the face of Ali. And Ali, who's had his dagger out, ready to cut the guy's head off, puts his sword back in his sheath and walks away. And in a way that can only happen in great Muslim stories, there's a battle going on around them, but Ali and the infidel get to have a 20-page dialogue, and nobody bugs them. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, and the infidel starts talking to Imam Ali and says, um, Lion of God, you had me defeated. Why didn't you finish the job? And Ali's response is, up until that moment, everything that I did was for the sake of God. If I had killed you, it would have been for the sake of God. When you spat on my face, I got angry. If I kill you now, I would be killing you for the sake of my own ego. And then he's got this wonderful pun. I am a kuh, not a kah. I'm a mountain of a soul. I don't get blown here and there just because the wind of lust and anger and passion come. I'm not like a piece of straw that can get caught up in the winds of my own desire. But notice what Ali's also saying. It's not that he no longer gets angry. It's not that he no longer has enoughs. It's that he is in charge of his nafs, not the other way around. And not surprisingly, the, the infidel um, asks, where can I sign up for these teachings? And, and uh, as all great Muslim stories do, becomes, becomes Muslim. Um, let me ask you to take a look at the, second, the back side of that page. And I'd like to maybe just point out a couple of interesting examples. Um, the, the column that you have on the right-hand side is uh, the story of Imam Ali that we just talked about. So I'll just point out a couple of quick things, and then we can open it up for question and answers. On the left-hand side of your page, you got a story uh, where the number six is. A teacher tells a boy who's cross-eyed, 
And yes, this is an, what we would call ableist narrative. It's making fun of someone for their physical handicap. Um, he sends a boy who's cross-eyed saying, go fetch me that bottle. The cross-eyed kid goes, he gets to the bottle, but because he's cross-eyed, he sees multiple bottles. And he's like, I don't know which one to get for you, right? And then Molana works that story over and over again. Because guess who is the cross-eyed boy? We are. We are. There is one God, one humanity, one guidance. But we insist on seeing them as multiple. We refuse to see the oneness of humanity in all of humanity. We refuse to see the oneness of God at work everywhere. How do you solve the problem of being cross-eyed? You uncross your eyes. Which is part of what the teachings of the Masnavi are designed to do. To help you look past the external form and see the inner reality, the inner meaning. We've talked about this idea um, that all of the characters in the Masnavi are inside you. This also extends to the Quranic characters. And one has to be a little careful about this. Molana is not offering Thomas Jefferson's version of the Quran. This isn't the Enlightenment tradition. He does clearly have faith in Abraham and Christ and the prophets and the companions of the cave and all of them as real historical beings. But at other times, he will also ask you, and you, singular you, the reader you, you've read the story of Moses and the Pharaoh. Who is the Moses of your soul? What in you calls out, just like the Pharaoh, indeed, I am God? So you begin to realize that the prophets and the prophetic narratives also correspond to tendencies and faculties inside us. And you see this in number seven, the Ashab Kaf, the companions of the cave, famous Christian apocryphal story that also shows up in the Quran. The companions of the cave today are found. They're right before you and heard all around. Right? The Companions of the Cave, well-known Quranic story, a few people who run away from an unjust king, they go to sleep in a cave and their dog is there. Note to Muslims, their dog is there. <laughs> and their dog is one of the illuminated beings. Like, let's get rid of this silly hatred of one of God's creatures. <coughs> Resume point. <laughs> Companions of the cave today are found, they're right before you. Here and now, there are those companions of the cave. No, they're not, you're not just reading historical allegories. Bottom of the page, you got the story of the Mi'raj, well-known, well-beloved story of Islam, the central spiritual experience of the Prophet Muhammad. And Gabriel accompanies the Prophet to the very threshold of God and stops. The Prophet says, faithful companion, you've come with me from Mecca to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to heaven, each layer of heaven. Now we get to God and you stop. And Gabriel says, if I take a step as wide as a single one of my feathers, all of my wings are going to burn up. The intensity of God's love is too strong for me to go on any further. Right? That's a well-known Muslim story, but look at what Mulana is doing with it. In classical Islamic thought, the angels, angels always correspond to the intellect. They are the aql. You need your intelligence, you need your reason, your rationality, you need your aql to get you from here to the threshold of God. But you can't go into God with your cleverness. 
what is it that can enter into God? Love, which is what the prophet is for Molana. He says this clearly and as openly as, as one can proclaim. The prophet is that divine love and affection that is immortal. The prophet represents divine love for the cosmos. It's for the sake of the prophet that God creates. And because the prophet is love and God is love, that love can enter into love. So here you get the complementarity of intelligence and love as part of a spiritual path. And I think I'll end the section of reading the Masnavi with the section 10 that you have, which I think is significant. So this is the well-known hadith that for the last 10 years, um, every Muslim speaker has always reminded us of, that real jihad is the inner jihad. The jihad out there, that's the little tiny jihad. The big jihad is the jihad against the demons of yourself. Good. Nice. Excellent. Molana is doing something a little more sophisticated than that. He says, around line 1383, the self is hell. Your nafs is hell. Hell is not a place that you go to and you say, how did I end up here? <laughs> Hell is something that we create. When we hate, we create hate and we create fire. When we experience anger, unjustified anger, we are creating the fuel that keeps hell burning. And the example that they give for this is very clear. Ever have like one of those kick out nasty drag out fights and you get hot under the collar? The heat that you're experiencing, that is the very stuff of hellfire. But there's another part. There's the heaven. So what's heaven? For some, a nice garden, four rivers, silk cushions and shade, possibility of companions. If that's the heaven that you want, mazel tov. <laughs> May God give you that heaven, right? This is how Mulana and all of the Sufis of what we're going to call the extreme love tradition, mazhab ish take it. Think of that beautiful Quranic verse that usually we recite when somebody passes, passes away. Ya ayyuhan nafsil mutma'inna, O soul at peace. Irja'i ila rabbika radiyatan mardiyatan. Return to your Lord, you pleased with God and God pleased with you. And then here's the key passage. And this is the voice of God speaking. Fatkhuli fi ibadi. Enter in my servants. And enter my garden, enter my paradise. Now, Arabic is a beautiful language. Molana is a master of Arabic, as also a master of Persian. Knows a little Turkish, a little Greek, a little couple of other things. There are two ways you can learn, you can read that verse. Enter in my servants. You can read it the way that nowadays the Quran translators translate it, which is, and enter in, comma, O oh, my servants. My servants, y'all, come on in, if God was a southern. <laughs> or, or, you can read it the way that Molana and the people from the love tradition read it. Fatkhuli fi ebadi. And when you enter into my servants, fee inside my servants, but holy jannati, you have entered my paradise. If you can find a person of God, someone that has cleaned up themselves from their nafs, and you get to be taken, bless you, 
taken into their heart the love and the affection and the fellowship that you experience, that joy is the very stuff of paradise. So, so that we have some time for question and answers, let me um, pause here. There's obviously a lot more that one could say and perhaps should say. Let me just pause here and come back to where we started, which is, what does this have to do with stuff today? We are, perhaps, God forbid, on the verge of yet another needless, immoral, expensive, destructive war. Something that um, Dr. King called a demonic suction tube. It doesn't get more vivid than that. The main point of Molana about love is that the love of God is intrinsically bound up with the love of humanity. You can't get to God without loving people. It's the most difficult path and the only path. And it's not enough to say, I want there to be no war. I want to feed people. I want to provide shelter for people because I feel sorry for them. If your approach to people is based on pity, pity is predicated on an assumption that you are higher than them. You are better than them. You are superior to them. Right? We're not talking about pity. We're not talking about take pity on someone. We're talking about love. We're talking about the recognition that for me to live as a human and for me to get to God, my fate is bound up with your fate. We are caught up as better people than I have said, in an inescapable network of mutuality. And where's the love and justice connection? Think of what someone like Brother West has said. Justice is what love looks like in public. What I would want for my beautiful four children, what you all would want for your most beloved ones, the love that Molana would talk about as the cosmic force that comes from God and takes us back to God, this is what we want for the totality of humanity. And something that blocks the way of that is not just being pitiful, it is depriving all of us of the means to live a meaningful human life. Let me stop here and open it up for questions and, and uh, comments and answers. And um, uh, thank you again for the gift of your, your time. Well, let me be the first one amongst many, I'm sure, here is going to congratulate you on an absolutely spectacular uh, rendering uh, of ideas. Um, and uh, that's great. Just a couple of very quick points and perhaps embedded questions and would like to hear your views on, on this. Um, you mentioned extracting, I'm trying to use your words, uh, mm. I wrote them down at you. Extracting Mavlana <coughs> from religion, in a yeah. sense, you talked about what happened there. And you, I see that you never used the word Sharia. And here, of course, I'm bringing in Sharia and Tariqa. And uh, how can we counter this? Because actually, I've been in conferences, and there are more conferences coming in this very city yeah. in which exactly this is happening. Right. So like uh, some people have hijacked Islam, now it's the turn to hijack Nablana, Shariism, right. I don't know what's next. Right. Okay, so your, your uh, views of that. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, the approach that I take, I hope, inshallah, is consistent with the approach that Molana would have taken, with the approach that most of the um, people from this grand love tradition would have taken, which is they simply go back to the story of the prophet when he's visited by the angel Gabriel. Um, Gabriel comes when the prophet is sitting in the company of his companions, his friends, and he's dressed all in white. So right off the bat, you know that something's not exactly kosher, because in a desert context, you don't get to wear all white. Nobody does. You're always dusty. You are khaki. 
The word khaki comes from khaki, the Persian word, khak, right? You wear khaki, you don't wear white. And Gabriel sits next to the prophet and says, what is your favorite color? No, uh, what <laughs> is Islam? And the prophet says, you know, what, what Islam is. Uh, and, and this unknown person, who ends up, of course, at the end to be Gabriel, says, you've answered correctly. And the companions are like, who the heck is this guy who is affirming the fact that the prophet knows the definition of Islam? right? And then he says, what is faith? And the prophet says, to have faith in God and the angels. You have answered correctly. And then the last part, what is Ihsan? Ihsan, the word that sometimes we translate as spirituality, excellence, virtue, it's making beautiful. It's husn. It's bringing into existence everything that's good and beautiful. And the prophet says, it's to worship God as if you see him. And if you don't, to remember that God sees you. And the way that the Arabic can also read, of course, is also, and if you don't, but you do, <laughs> that God still sees you. And so there's that sense that we're thinking of a structure whereby what we tend to think of as Islam is simply the foundation. It is not the end result. Within the context of the Quran, you have a group of nomads who say, um, we have faith. And the Prophet is ordered to say to them, you've become Muslim, but you don't have faith yet. And I would argue, in today's world, not only in the Islamic context, but in every religious tradition, you got a lot of religious people who display, sadly, no beauty, no kindness. They've managed, as Sheikh Hamza once said, to do the unthinkable, which is to render Islam into an ugly religion. Question? If I could just ask folks to really, you know, speak into the microphone, we're, we're trying to do two things here. We're trying to keep it cool, uh, but there is a hum in the background and we're taping. So just so we hear you, if you could just speak clearly into the microphone. Thank you. Could you elaborate a little bit on your title, which you use love as a GPS of divine secrets. But w if you don't have love, the GPS doesn't work. My GPS never works, uh, so um, yes, thank you for that. Um, so it's a reference to a famous line that you have uh, within, the, within the Masnavi, and it's the passage that in your handout is um, uh, next to the number four. Being a lover means your heart must ache. No sickness hurts as much as when hearts break. The lover's ailment's totally unique. Love is the astrolabe of all we seek, right? Uh, astrolab, right? This is the device that Muslims used in the medieval time, as did all people in the Mediterranean region, to, f to figure out where we are and what time is it and when's the next prayer time based on the location of the stars. So the astrolabe is something that is usually yeah, paraded out as a great um, example of the Islamic sciences. Um, and, uh, and I was thinking of what, what does the word astrolabe mean to us today? It meant a lot to medieval Europeans. Peter Abelard liked the astrolabe so much, he named his son after it. Um, for most of us today, we don't use an astrolabe, but we use a GPS. Uh, which uses satellite imagery and stuff like that. So the, the uh, analogy that I was making is that love, ishq, radical love, extreme love, is the GPS that helps us, you know how GPSs have a go home button? We want to go home. And the way to go home is through love. Uh, did Maulana ever got to this stage uh, of Mansur Hallaj, for instance, where he started saying, I'm an al haq You know, he immersed his soul so much into God's being that he started saying that, and it, does it occur in his uh, 
poetry. Yeah. So the question was whether Molana ever gets to the point of saying, as uh, Mansur Halaj says, uh, al haq or I am, I am truth, by extension, I am God. Um, it's a very complicated question because, for starters, let's just remember that we don't actually know if Halaj ever said an al haq it's entirely possible that he was just killed because he got caught up in some political troubles and everything. Nevertheless, the Sufi tradition remembers him as having said an al haq so we'll have to take it seriously. And Maulana has lines where he references Halaj and also Bayezid Bistami, the other great saint uh, of the same time period, uh, as saying, Subhani, glory be to me, and, and all of that. Um, as for his own temperament, he's a lover. He's not a boaster. He's a lover in the sense that he doesn't ever say, I am God. But he does say, in my dear friend Shams, I came to see divine qualities. Shams in man right? You are my Shams and you are my Lord. Small L or big L, however you want to do it. And this idea that divine qualities are not abstract. We're not in Plato's cave. These are not ideal types. That's where he is. The folk, why, why love? Why love as the thing that solves the problem of the ego? Because to love, you direct your affection, your attention, your love, your service towards somebody else. Not mine. Somebody else. Right? You have a child. The child is cute and chubby and entirely helpless. You clean up their shit day and night. And you do it with love. Right? Love is what takes you from the focus on me to the focus on you. And the minute you've done that, the minute you've stopped worshiping the me and you've put yourself in service towards somebody else, you're already there. So I would say that Molana himself doesn't boast as much about the Anal Haq and, and what have you. He does connect it to, to Shams. And there's a beautiful way that we see this in, in action. I love some of Molana's followers who are um, rookie Sufis. They're the newbies. They're the ones who get everything wrong. They try to say proper things, and stuff comes out improperly. And there's a Greek guy, Christian guy, named Suryanos, who's just converted and he's become initiated. And he loves, 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 loves Molana. And he's learning Persian, but his mother tongue is Greek. So he's not able to say things properly. So he goes around one day and, you know, he's like, he calls Molana what his followers were calling him, Hazrat Khodavandegar, um, divine, the person in whom we feel divine presence, his lordship. Right? Because it's kind of like when we would say um, his, his Highness, you know, the Dalai Lama or what have you. And some more um, uptight people give him a hard time and they're like, why are you calling him God? And Saryana says, no, 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 I'm not getting this language right. Um, what I meant to call him was not God. I meant to call him, and he thinks about all the Persian words he knows, Khodasaz. God maker. <laughs> and they're like, that's it. Go get the bonfire. We're just going to have a rotisserie infidel party right here. And then right before they roast the guy, they're like, so why would you call him God maker? And he says, did I, did I say that wrong? Um, <laughs> when I said that he's the God maker, and then pay attention to this, what I meant to say was, he, Molana, makes God real to me. He makes God. He makes God real for me. Before I met him, he says, God was a word. God was an idea. Now, I know God is real, because I've seen him. I've seen the embodiment of these qualities. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, you mentioned a lot about the uh, Majnun, the, um, the lovers, uh, the Eshk, but there was a, another uh, school, the dry school, the uh, Junaidi school. 
um, how was how were they related pretty much uh, how, uh, what was uh, Rumi's reaction to the dry school the sober school um, thank you for that question there, there's a lot of scholars including scholars that I respect immensely and I've tried to learn a little bit from who really love this dichotomy of sober Sufis and drunk Sufis I don't buy it 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 next question um, so it's a you you can be in love with God and you can be an enamored soul shift it but you can either express it or you can keep it inside and let the fire burn there's raging fire and then there's a fire under coals they're both fire So you talked about um, love and the cure for love is in the cause. In Musnavi, Maulana talks about the sickness of the heart and the cure for that sickness is love. So can we, yes we can interpret the sickness, but how can, what is the path to that cure? Can you read that in Musnavi? Very good question. Um, very good question. So I would say that um, the, for Molana, for all of the Sufi traditions, they never intended their writings to be sold as um, the complete idiot's guide to divine love. Um, everything you wanted to know about how to get to God with love but were afraid to ask. Th there's always the notion that you need a guide. You need a teacher, you need a mentor. Because every craft in their society required a mentor. You couldn't be a jeweler by going on Google and looking up things. If you wanted to become a jeweler, you studied with a master jeweler. You learned the techniques, and when the master would decide that you know enough to become a master in your own right, you would graduate to that rank. The same thing for all of the artisans and all of the crafts people of Islamic civilizations. The Sufis say, we too have a craft. Our craft is the sir. Why do you need a guide to take you? Think about Surat al-Fatiha, right? Ehtina Surat al-Mustaqim. Read every Quran translation that there is out there. How do we translate it? Guide us to the straight path. Right? How boring. How deadly boring. And inaccurate. Because if you go back and look at what the term Sirat al-Mustaqim meant in a 7th century context, it was, you want to go on a caravan journey from here to Philadelphia, but make it a desert context. There's not enough water you can put on the back of your camels. You need to stop at an oasis. If you don't, you will die the most miserable death possible, which is your tongue will swell up and you will choke on your own tongue. So what do you need? You need a guide. You need a guide who's gone on the path and come back alive, and gone on the path and alive and back and alive. Somebody who knows the path, somebody who is the path. The Quran isn't FedEx to us, you know, God dropping the Quran on the doors of humanity being like, can I have a signature for that, you know? The Quran and every scripture, every teaching is sent with a guide who is the path. The Prophet is the Quran, as Aisha told us, right? And I would say the same thing for a Sufi context, that these teachings were always intended uh, to be lived out in a community setting under the supervision of of a teacher. Um, but where are these teachers to be found today? That's the, that's the challenge. Can I make one shameless invitation? Yeah. So um, we live, as, as we kind of have said a couple of times before, uh, in a world where people that have access to fear mongering have all kinds of means at their disposal. Um, I, because I'm an unrepentant humanist. 
uh, I'm persuaded by the fact that beautiful things happen when we as human beings come together. Um, I'd like to just extend an invitation to people who are interested on the front side of your diagram, the one that has the um, metaphor of the, the image of the, of the Masnavi. I put my name and email and there's a URL for an educational tour focused on Islam and Sufism, in particular the Masnavi, for people who are interested in coming and encountering people from another part of the world and being persuaded of our shared humanity and in the process study the Masnavi, not in an hour, but over a two-week period. That invitation is open for anybody and everybody who's, uh, who's interested. So. Join me in thanking Professor Omid Sadi.